Hey folks, Scott Weingar here, and this is the MCRIT Podcast. Today, a guest lecture done by my friend Ruben Strayer at the Smack Dub Conference. It is entitled Disruption, Danger, and Dropyridol, and I am quite sure you will love it. As always, come to the site for any comments or questions, mcrit.org slash 185. Morning, everyone. We're going to move from fear to agitation. So it's a whirlwind of emotions. So I'm Ruben Strayer. I'm an emergency doc living and working in New York. It is a real pleasure to be here with all of you guys in Dublin during the uh, European Football Championship, where uh, it turns out that uh, a lot of Europeans get agitated. Um, <laughs> so it's timely that we're going to talk about agitation. And I'm going to start with a question. What patient defines emergency medicine? Is it the gunshot wound to the chest, the STEMI and cardiogenic shock, the nearly arrested 38 weeks pregnant patient with massive pulmonary embolism, or is it the ankle sprain, the sore throat, the medication refill? Or is this just really an annoying question? Of course, all of these patients define emergency medicine. What the first group have in common is that they are all patently sick, and the second group are all patently well. So while each of these patients present their own challenges, there's a sense in which they're all pretty easy. You kind of know what you're going to do with these patients. Some would say that the patient who best defines emergency medicine is the undifferentiated patient, the patient who seems well but is actually ill, the patient who looks stable but may be harboring a dangerous condition, the undifferentiated chest pain, abdominal pain, headache, dizzy patient. I would say, however, that the patient who most requires the unique skill set of the emergency provider is the patient with undifferentiated acute agitation. The acutely agitated patient is an immediate threat to himself and an immediate threat to you and your staff. And that threat must often be managed with powerful drugs and aggressive maneuvers that can cause harm and often do cause harm. And at the same time that you're trying to leverage these powerful drugs and aggressive maneuvers to control your patient, you have to figure out if the patient in front of you is just drunk and needs to sleep it off, or if, there's, if this patient has a life threat, one of any number of life threats, life threats that might be the cause of his agitation or the effect of his agitation. The acutely agitated patient must be simultaneously controlled, resuscitated, and risk stratified. This is a challenge. It's a challenge we're going to take on in the next 20 minutes. I've divided emergency agitation into three types. I'm going to very quickly cover the agitated but cooperative patient, spend a little bit more time on the patients who are merely disruptive, and focus on excited delirium. The agitated but cooperative patient is the mildly psychotic schizophrenic, the mildly demented old lady, the intoxicated teenager who should have been brought home instead of to the hospital. There's no concern for a dangerous condition in this group. These folks respond to suggestion, they respond to kindness, they respond to a sandwich. <laughs> the best way to manage them is to have someone sit with them, keep them occupied. If there's no one who can do this, and you can't just discharge them, you can give them a milligram or two of lorazepam orally or whatever. That's all I'm going to say about the agitated but cooperative patient. These folks don't trouble us too much. The next level of agitation seen by emergency medicine are the disruptive without danger patients who are, by and large, intoxicated but not delirious. You can converse with them. You can engage them and briefly redirect them, but ultimately they are not responsive to suggestion. They are loud and disruptive and they need to be sedated. Again, and importantly, there's minimal concern for a dangerous condition in this group. These patients are accessible. You can do a reasonable history and physical and feel confident that simple intoxication usually is the diagnosis. We want these guys to just sleep it off. They're going to wake up and go home. Many departments see many of these patients per day. In departments where I work, I see some of these patients many times per day. <laughs> this is your routine agitated drunk. And in many departments, these patients are observed, if you want to call it that, in an unmonitored bed. Because there's, these patients do not present a, a threat to themselves or others, because we're not concerned about a dangerous condition, 
We're willing to sacrifice speed in getting them sedated to make sure that we don't cause any harm with the drugs that we use. So this is the place for your classic five and two. Haldol five, Ativan two, will work reasonably well, if not slowly, most of the time in this group. And Haldol five, Lorazepam two, will almost never cause any problems. So five and two is fine. If you want to do better than fine, single agent droperidol. Droperidol is the most effective agent for undifferentiated agitation, period. I'm going to state this as a fact and not try to convince you with evidence because that's boring and we don't have time. But when you see references in the bottom right, you can contact me and I will send you supporting literature. If you don't see references on a slide, that means that what I'm saying is just my opinion and might be total nonsense. Droperidol is not only the most effective but also the safest agent for undifferentiated agitation. This has been demonstrated conclusively in numerous studies, of which I've listed a few. Droperidol has been used for decades, tens of millions of patients, with an, with an indisputable record of safety. So much has been made of the QT black box, the droperidol black box. The concern that droperidol is going to cause clinically significant QT prolongation and torsades is nonsense. I'm not going to get into the suspicious circumstances around the FDA's decision to apply a black box to droperidol, but the circumstances are suspicious. Droperidol is cheap, and there are expensive drugs to be sold. And here is a list of, of medications that are relevant to emergency medicine that also have a black box that you never hear about. This list includes Haldol and midazolam, which no one seems to have any concerns about. I don't know how all this went down in Dublin, but in the US, when the FDA slapped droperidol with a black box, it was as though suddenly using droperidol was criminal. Suddenly, after decades of safe use, millions of doses, using droperidol was a death sentence. Overnight, departments across the country restricted droperidol, made you do an EKG before you give droperidol. You have never seen such rapid knowledge uptake. It was as though the FDA black box were tweeted by Kim Kardashian. And now, droperidol is gone. The last manufacturer in the United States stopped making it a few years ago, and it's essentially unavailable in the US. Droperidol was too good, too cheap, too effective for too many indications. It had to go. If you practice in a more civilized country and still have access to droperidol, 5 to 10 milligrams will put your agitated drunk to sleep with extraordinary reliability and safety in a couple minutes. Droperidol is the most effective agent for the disruptive without danger patient. The second best is probably midazolam. Midazolam is great for agitation because you want to give agitation meds IM. We'll come back to this in a second. And you can think of the M in midazolam as standing for intramuscular. If you have an IV, all commonly used benzodiazepines are pretty fast acting. But midazolam is much more effective and reliable and fast than all the others by the intramuscular route. So whatever the indication, be it agitation or seizures or withdrawal or whatever, if you're giving a benzodiazepine intramuscularly and speed and efficacy matter, it must be midazolam. And the dose is 5 to 10 milligrams, just like droperidol. 5 milligrams is going to sedate most of your drunks, and 10 milligrams will sedate almost any agitated patient. But you have to be careful with midazolam. Dosing midazolam is trickier because you will see respiratory depression with Versed. Even at 5 milligrams, especially in combination with alcohol, you will see clinically important respiratory depression, and that just doesn't happen with droperidol. And big doses of midazolam cause a lot of respiratory depression and occasionally apnea. So when you use midazolam as monotherapy, for agitation, you have to be prepared to manage respiratory depression because you might need a big dose because midazolam is also less effective than droperidol. There's a small group of patients who have paradoxical responses to benzodiazepines. They get more agitated with benzos and a much larger group of patients who are benzodiazepine resistant requiring huge doses to have any effect. So midazolam is inferior to droperidol for the very common disruptive without danger patient. But haloperidol is also inferior to droperidol. So if you don't have droperidol and you're trying to choose between haldol and midazolam, it's more of a toss-up. Midazolam works much faster than haldol, which is really nice. But getting the right dose of midazolam can be hard because the window between effectively sedating and respiratory depression is actually pretty narrow and difficult to predict in the patient in front of you. 
If my agitated patient's going to be monitored, I give five to 10 milligrams of midazolam. If no monitor, which is, again, most of the, of the folks where I work are not gonna be monitored, I give big doses of Haldol with small doses of midazolam in the same syringe, which is much more effective than five and two and safer than five to 10 of straight first said. So for disruptive without danger, the best is droperidol, five to 10. Second best is midazolam, be mindful of respiratory depression. And then if you don't have a droperidol and you don't want to monitor your patient, give a big dose of Haldol with small doses of midaz. If your first dose doesn't work and you need to give another dose, it's okay. These, these patients are disruptive, but there's no danger. So if it takes a little bit longer to sedate them, to get them to sleep 10, 15 minutes, and you have to give another dose, it's no problem. We wanna be very careful not to over-sedate these patients. Again, these patients are not going to be monitored. We want to sedate them gently. This is in direct contrast to the patient with excited delirium. The disruptive without danger patient is very routine. And the key is to distinguish this patient from cases where there is danger, because patients who are more likely to have a dangerous condition require a very different approach. And that approach is what we're gonna spend the rest of our time discussing, the approach to excited delirium. And the first part is to decide what excited delirium is. Excited delirium is rare. It's not a routine presentation, except seemingly in Australia, where apparently, much of the population is wandering around the country in, in a state of chronic, smoldering agitation. <laughs> which is great for agitation research. So thanks to Australia for that. The excited delirium patient is delirious and dangerous. Dangerous to himself, dangerous to others, and may have one or more manifest or occult dangerous conditions. Often, when you're confronted with excited delirium, it's obvious, the danger is apparent. But sometimes the line between disruptive and delirious is a blurry line, and it takes skill and experience to know when the patient in front of you is just drunk and needs to sleep it off, or when there's something more going on. The level of agitation can be a big clue. Excited delirium patients are often not just yelling and shouting, they are thrashing. They are being held down and struggling to break free despite futility, despite painful things being done to them and without tiring. The excited delirium patient may be harboring a dangerous condition. These patients are not just angry, they are incoherent, unengageable, unable to participate in conversation. These patients may have a fluctuating cognition and level of consciousness that you just don't see in the merely drunk. Vital signs can, of course, be a big clue, but if you have to have five guys hold down your agitated patient to get vitals, you are more likely to be dealing with excited delirium, and it is probably best to proceed in that direction. Forget about the vitals for now. As always, when you're not sure, err on the side of presuming there, there's a dangerous condition. Disruptive versus delirious can be hard. Drunks exist to embarrass emergency doctors. So when you're not sure, treat as excited delirium. So how do you do that? The first step is to assemble adequate force to make sure it's safe to approach the patient. That means ideally five big strong people, one at each limb and one at the head, not including the nurse preparing and administering medications, not including the provider who's, who's attending the patient. Obviously this is very environment specific and you're gonna have to make do with whatever you have. But if you feel routinely overwhelmed and underprepared by violent, for violent patients, then implement a hospital code white, an agitated patient alert, where designated personnel drop what they're doing and, and respond, come to the bedside, ready to help. And the next step is to put face mask oxygen, high flow face mask oxygen on the patient to cover mouth and nose. You do this immediately. You don't wait for a saturation. You don't get a history, you just do it. And you do it in whatever position the patient is in, including and especially if the patient is being held face down. This accomplishes two crucial things. Firstly, it controls the patient's spit, which is very, very important. And secondly, providing oxygen provides oxygen, <laughs> which is so enormously important. And you would think that would be obvious to emergency providers, but in my experience, this maneuver does not happen unless I make it happen, and you have to make it happen. It is very common to see a gloved hand aggressively covering the mouth and nose of, a, of an agitated, hyperadrenergic, hyperthermic patient or a forearm compressing the neck, asphyxiating the patient in an attempt to hold him down, or a knee compressing the chest, preventing chest excursion. Coming, if you ask a police officer who just got spit on to move his hand, that may not work, but if you come at the mouth 
with oxygen that will work, and it can be a life-saving maneuver. Pull the straps on the face mask tight to hold it in position. I have seen more than one case where this maneuver alone calmed the patient, demonstrating or at least suggesting that the agitation was from hypoxia. You cannot let that happen. Apply face mask oxygen first thing. And the next step is to relieve dangerous restraint holds. So if someone is compressing the neck or compressing the chest, forcefully reposition that person to a limb. Chest compression is an important possible consequence of vest restraints or straitjackets. So if one of these is being used, make sure it's not too tight. If the patient's arms are being pulled posteriorly and inferiorly in the so-called hog tie or hobble position, they must be repositioned. This position is very dangerous. The prone position is an intermediate risk position. The prone position, face down, chest down, should be relieved at this point if possible. But if you think it's too dangerous to right the patient who's prone, as long as the patient's getting oxygen and there is no neck compression or chest compression, which is compression of the back in this case, you can leave the patient prone until sedation kicks in. And the next step in the management of excited delirium is chemical restraint, not physical restraints. In every place I've ever worked, as soon as the patient is subdued by force, the next move has been to apply tight restraints. This is the wrong move. This is a dangerous move. It's the wrong move because you are wasting precious time. These are patients who often have a dangerous condition and applying restraints takes time, never less than five minutes. And in those same five minutes, you could have the patient calm so that you can pivot from control to resuscitation. Furthermore, when you've physically restrained a severely agitated patient, you haven't made much progress. That patient is still a threat to himself through ongoing struggle, if not a threat to others, and requires sedation to manage that threat and to manage the uh, possible medical threats associated with his condition. And worst of all, there is often a punitive or even sadistic element at work here in overpowering these patients who are cursing at us and spitting at us and otherwise making us angry. Overcome this anger, overcome this unfortunate tradition. As soon as adequate force has been assembled, face mask oxygen applied, dangerous restraint holds relieved, focus all your efforts on maximally rapid and effective chemical restraint. And unless your patient has an IV that is known to be functional, chemical restraint of the agitated patient should be given intramuscularly, not intravenously. It is the routine of some departments and some providers to ask nurses to start lines on these patients as they are being held down, thrashing about, please do not do this. This needlessly, totally unnecessarily subjects your staff to a needle stick risk, and starting a line on a thrashing patient often requires more than one attempt, which takes time time that is much better spent watching the patient calm after an IM shot. After your patient is still, you can start your line and do all the other things you need to do. So for agitation, meds are given IM. Always IM, always, always, always IM. And that IM shot should be given through the clothing. Don't try to remove the clothing, just give a single IM shot in the anterolateral thigh, upper outer gluteal quadrant, or deltoid through the clothes. Since you're dealing with excited delirium, you have concern for a dangerous condition. The priority is immediate control so that dangerous conditions can be identified and managed. So in contrast to disruptive without danger, we are willing to err on over-sedation in these patients. Over-sedation essentially means respiratory depression, and this we can manage, usually with uh, simple maneuvers like a jaw thrust, occasionally requiring a period of assisted ventilation. And if you put your excited delirium patient so deep that you need to intubate that patient, that is not a problem. That is excellent care. That is taking a dangerous situation and making it safe. We don't like to intubate patients who don't need to be intubated, but if your severely agitated patient turns out to be very sensitive to Versed and you have to tube that patient, you are doing well by that patient and by your staff. That is not an error or an adverse event. That is good care. In the excited delirium patient, when you're concerned about a dangerous condition, you need rapid single shot success. You need not just sedation, but tranquilization. You need 100% efficacy immediately in one IM shot. And so the agent of choice for chemical restraint in excited delirium is ketamine. Ketamine has excellent pharmacokinetics by the intramuscular route and delivers anyone, regardless of how large, aggressive, intoxicated, or borderline, perfectly still and quiet, while airway breathing and circulation are maintained in about three minutes. 
When you need 100% efficacy immediately, nothing beats and nothing matches dissociative dose ketamine for tranquilization. Many of these patients have hyperdynamic vitals, and there's a concern that because ketamine increases heart rate and blood pressure in quiet patients who are getting procedural sedation, that it's gonna cause a problem in these hyperadrenergic patients who already have a high heart rate and blood pressure. But now we know that excited delirium patients with hyperdynamic vitals see their vitals normalize with dissociative dose ketamine. So whatever the vitals, whatever the cause of agitation, whether it be psychiatry, cocaine, PCP, from which ketamine is derived, or even ketamine itself. If your patient snorted some ketamine, then lost his mind and, prevents severe, and presents severely agitated, the drug to sedate that patient is dissociative dose ketamine. When you give dissociative dose ketamine, your patient will become dissociated, which means you are doing procedural sedation, and you must monitor that patient in the way you would monitor a PSA patient with special attention to ventilation, in addition to whatever caused the patient to enter into an uncontrolled thrashing rage to begin with. The intramuscular dissociative dose of ketamine is four to six milligrams per kilogram. For most adults, skip the math, just give 500 milligrams and be done with it. As the patient calms, that is not your cue to apply tight restraints. There is no role for tight restraints in the emergency department. You just hold the patient and in a couple minutes, the patient will be still. In fact, you should take this opportunity to loosen any existing tight restraints that may have already been applied. If you wanna apply loose restraints, that's reasonable but should be unnecessary, especially initially. And this is the time to get the head of the bed up to reduce aspiration risk. Now that you have control, it's time to resuscitate. This proceeds according to usual principles with a, a couple of key considerations. You start with vital signs with special attention to temperature and capillary blood glucose. You take the oxygen off the patient and get a room air saturation because the patient that you just tranquilized is now at risk for hypoventilation, which can only be detected by pulse oximetry if the patient is breathing room air. If you need to give oxygen or want to give oxygen, use capnography. You're gonna establish resuscitative vascular access and almost all these patients will benefit from, an, from a, a crystalloid bolus, so just give it empirically. And the last part of managing excited delirium is the identification and treatment of its most important dangerous causes and effects. The first, the first ones that you need to be, pay special attention to in the first minutes are hypoxia, hyperthermia, hypoglycemia, and hypoperfusion from either hypovolemia or hemorrhage. The next round of concerns is hyperkalemia, acidemia, intracranial hemorrhage, and meningitis encephalitis. That is not to say that every excited delirium patient needs a CTLP, but ask the question, does this patient need a CTLP? There are a variety of important causes of severe agitation that have specific therapies, Many of them are listed here. And rhabdomyolysis and trauma are important effects of agitation that should be specifically sought. Injuries are common in this group and may be occult, so examine closely and image liberally. So to bring this all together, I've presented this as a, as a distinction between disruptive and, and danger. And I think this is an important model, but in practice, there is a continuum of agitation and likelihood of a dangerous condition among these patients. And so there's a lot of room along this condition, along this continuum for style and preference in terms of the drugs that you choose. There have been lots of cocktails and agents that have been used to great effect, and we haven't even discussed the new antipsychotics that are now available for intramuscular use, which is very appealing because these agents are almost as effective as conventional sedatives for 10 times the price. And we haven't discussed subdissociative dose ketamine which is trickier to use but can be effective, so you've got options, and the agent or agents that you choose will always depend on your environment and the, and the characteristics of the agitated patient in front of you. But I find that this framework is helpful, and I hope that you do too. So in summary, when confronted with an agitated patient, the most important question is, do you have a concern for a dangerous condition? If no, if you're not concerned, you're just dealing with the disruptive patient, five and two is fine, midazolam better, droperidol best, repeat until asleep. If you are concerned about a dangerous condition, if you're worried that you might be dealing with excited delirium, the first step is to assemble adequate force so that it's safe to approach the patient. You apply face mask oxygen, first thing to cover the mouth and nose. You relieve any compression of the chest or neck and deliver tranquilization, dissociative dose ketamine. You loosen any tight restraints, get the head of the bed up, get vital signs, room air pulse ox or capnography, establish vascular access and give a crystalloid bolus, and then proceed with the rest of resuscitation with special attention to the most important causes and effects of severe agitation. I'm launching a Kickstarter campaign 
to bring a droperidol manufacturing plant back to the United States. <laughs> you can see the blueprint here. Thank you. Initial estimates suggest that I need about $500 million. <laughs> Every little bit helps. Thanks, everyone, for your attention. Thank you, Ruben. Uh, very good, practical, no-nonsense advice. Um, one question came through. Uh, comments, I forget who. Using the face mask for oxygen basically affords the opportunity now for an inhalational agent. Is there anything down that route, given your droperidol drought? Yeah, so you, uh, inhalational sedatives? Yeah. Yeah, so there's uh, some emerging e evidence on inhalational loxapine. I don't know if any of you guys have used inhalational loxapine, which is a, a conventional antipsychotic, but there's now some interesting evidence that you can sedate patients very effectively with uh, inhalational loxapine. So if any of you guys have access to that, that sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> All right, well, in the interest of time, we'll leave it there, but thank Thanks you very, very much, much Ruben Strayer.